Welcome to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? I'm Erin Summers. I'm a sports broadcaster that's covered the Atlantic Coast Conference for a very long time, and I grew up a fan. I've always been curious what players do after we obsess over them in college. This podcast answers that question. Each week, you'll hear an interview with a former ACC athlete. We'll find out everything they've been doing since playing in college. Thanks for listening. Let's jump in to ACC stars. Where are they now? This week, I'm joined by former Duke quarterback Thad Lewis. At Duke, Lewis set records for most passing touchdowns and career passing yards with over 10,000. After seven years bouncing from different NFL teams, Lewis is enjoying learning from some of the best in the sport as an offensive assistant with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Here's our conversation. Dad, I am so excited to talk to you um, on this podcast. Former Duke quarterback, currently with Tampa Bay. A lot of stuff has happened in between then. So we'll just let's just start with how are you doing and where are you calling in from? I'm doing great. I'm actually calling in from Tampa. Um, I'm in Tampa Bay. I'm right here at the team facility right now. Um, we just finished meetings, uh, meeting with the offensive guys. And so I'm in a team auditorium doing this podcast with you. I'm excited. Uh, you know, it's all about the ACC, so I'm excited. Yeah, a lot of stuff has happened for you throughout the eight, your time in the ACC. What brought you to the game of football to begin with? So I have an older brother that's nine years older than me, um, and I always wanted to do everything my brother did. And he played football. He played basketball. Um, so – I used to cry, too. He played at the Boys and Girls Club. I wasn't old enough. And I used to be like, when is going to be my turn? When can I play? When can I play? So I started playing football, baseball, basketball at all around the age of five. Um, and I played every sport every season. And uh, shoot, I've been, wow, yeah, I've been playing football since I was five years old. You come from a small town. You played for a high school that you took to the state championship when you were a senior there. What was it like doing that for your community? It's great, you know, because being in, in Miami in a small pocket in Opelika, a lot of people don't don't know about Opelika, but we're all from Miami. You know, it's just sectioned off. And we don't have a high school in our neighborhood, so we kind of get bused. So half of our neighborhood goes get bused to Miami Central. The other half of our neighborhood get bused to Highland Miami Lakes. But my brother went to that high school, and to do what they did 10 years after they did, um, went to the state semis with Rohan Davey and my brother and, and a couple of those guys um, before for us to come along after that um, was crazy. It was like deja vu all over again. We had the same coach, um, some of the same coaches, uh, we had some of the similar players. And just to do that, you know, the ultimate goal is to always win it. We didn't. But uh, just to bring that community back and to see the games packed again and the rivals between Hialeah and, and people coming out and excited to wear their Highland Miami Lake stuff. Um, I got I got instant gratification out of that more so than winning. What was the attention like surrounding your recruitment process? It was actually pretty, pretty big because a lot of people thought, you know, I would stay home, you know, but I didn't get recruited by the big three. Uh, Miami, Florida State, and Florida, they didn't recruit me. Um, so South Florida recruited me. Um, but, you know, just going around and I, the, the Miami Herald did a story on me. Every time I went on a recruitment visit, they would call and we would do the story and they would put it in the paper. So that was pretty cool. But what stuck out to me the most was I went to Texas Christian. I went to uh, Duke. I went to South Florida and I went to Pittsburgh. So Pittsburgh, I had never seen snow. I didn't own the jacket. I'm from Miami. <laughs> <laughs> so I buy a jacket and I'm in snow for the first time. I'm like, yeah, I can't make it up here. I go to Texas. Even though they do everything big in Texas, uh, taking us to all these fancy restaurants and stuff like that, I'm like, yeah, there's nobody here from the state of Florida on this team, let alone Miami. So I was like, okay, yeah, I, I don't know how much they actually trying to get into Miami, but I think all the Texas people are going to keep it Texas. And then South Florida, I was like, I'm not leaving. I'm I'm not staying home. I'm leaving. Um, so that was my mindset. But the thing that stood out when I went to Duke is I knew my brother had graduated from college. And I was like, well, he graduated. I have to graduate. So he went to Tuskegee and he graduated. So when I had the opportunity, Duke's graduation rate for athletes were in the 90%, the high 90s. 
The only reason it wasn't 100 because some of the NBA players leave early for the NBA. <laughs> It's basketball players, you know. So okay, I was like, yeah, I'll give that to you. Yeah. yeah, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, at least I know I get a degree from here. Um, and I felt like if I was good enough for football, then that would take care of itself. You picked a pretty tough place to go academically to say that you want to graduate from there. Right. I uh, didn't know what I was picking. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I learned this, though, in, in order to be ready for college, uh, if anybody, college, high school, any co- anybody listening to this podcast, take those AP classes, you know, take those hard classes, get ready for college because I wasn't, you know, obviously they taught me everything when I got mm-hmm. there. You know, the hardest part about schools like the Ivies, uh, you know, they call it like the Harvard of the South and Dukes and Vandy. The hardest thing is getting in. Once you get in, they do not want you to fail. You get what I'm saying? So they have mm-hmm. a lot of things in place. Um, but I wasn't prepared. I would be the first one to tell you that. Now, I learned very quick, you know, to get prepared. And I wound up graduating in three and a half years with a degree in sociology. So it worked out pretty good. Yeah, well, congrats on that, first of all. On Thank the you. football field, you also had a lot of success. However, didn't really show up in the win column to start with. Your first right. season there um, under Ted Roof, the, the head football coach at the time. And you go 0-12, your 12 your first year. And then 1-11, your your sophomore year. Coming in with the success that you had in high school, you're the 10th rated dual threat quarterback in the nation. How did you handle having a losing season? I cried a bunch. (laughs) You know, because it was important to me. And and at that time at Duke, um, a lot of people don't know, a lot of my guys – they they knew they, the NFL wasn't in their near future. So, you know, they were – so, hence, my left guard, I, Zach Marides, I don't know if he was my left guard or right guard. He He's the, the, the CEO and the owner of Teamworks that everybody uses in the country. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know what I'm saying? So, it was people like that that were on my team, and you knew they were going to be successful in something, but football wasn't. You know, I mean, they like to play football, but they figure like the NFL wasn't in my near future. And I was the one that was like, no, I want to make it to the NFL. That's always been a child dream of mine. And I remember breaking down crying. We played Matt Ryan in Boston um, and uh, I, and we lost that game, man. And I just broke down crying because I'm like, these guys, yeah, I thought guys didn't care. But they kind of knew that we wasn't as good as other people. So I figured, like, okay, cool. I can steal some stuff in, this, in these guys that I know that I, where I'm from and things like that. So going into my junior year with the new coach, I was like, look, I cannot have these seasons again. And um, I just started getting guys together. And I knew I had to help at recruiting. So I just was like, I need to get some better guys around. And they was like, yeah, we're going to go get some guys from Miami. We're bringing them up on the recruiting visit. I was like, cool. Like. I just need a few few guys to come up here that think the same way I get and we can get it rolling and it actually happened and uh, David Cutcliffe got the job. But how receptive were the coaches to your ideas and your plans of I know I want to come in here and I want to recruit people. I need to help change the culture. They actually came in and told me forget everything you've learned before we got here. You're gonna learn how to do stuff our way and we're gonna teach you a winning culture. And once they said that uh, people had already told me, like, hey, you got, you know, David Cutcliffe. I'm like, man, who is that guy? I didn't know he coached the Manning. I, I had no clue. I'm a young kid. From, and so they was like, just look him up. At that time, Google was really, you know, just getting started. So I was like, all right, all right, Google him. i look him up. And I was like, oh, he coached Peyton and, and Eli. And, it was, and T. Martin. So I knew of T. Martin, you know, and it's like, oh, wow, he coached some. Oh, okay. Well, I'll stay because at the time I was thinking about transferring if we didn't get a coach that I thought was going to help further my career. That was the point. But then it was like, do I leave the degree for Duke on the table to go play football or do I? It all worked out. I was. You talked that. about <laughs> Cutcliffe's resume. Obviously on paper, he's great with quarterbacks. But what was it about him as a person that made you want to stay there? Um. After I did my, my, my research, I was already there. You know, he inherited me. And I felt as though, like, where I'm from, we don't quit. You start something, you finish it. 
when I had started at Duke already and I've been there two years. So my whole thing for coming to Duke was leaving the place better than I found it. That's why I came. I knew I was one of the stepping stones in the building blocks of that. So I, I put things in perspective and was like, no, let's go. Like We're going to do what we got to do. Um, and it just blossomed, you know, but you have to remember at the time, Cutcliffe's the head coach. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not even really talking to him much, but my quarterback coach, Kurt Roper, was all over me, okay? <laughs> i never forget. He was all over me. And um, that was that was, that was was the best thing that happened to me, getting that coaching staff in there. The next year, Cutcliffe's first year, you go four and eight. You get your first win in the ACC against UVA. What are some yeah. highlights of that season for you? I remember coming out. It's, it's so funny, right? So, you know, it's the anticipated season. It's a new head coach. We're playing James Madison the first game of the season. So we go to Duke, right? You know, you figure Duke's a smart school. And Coach Cutcliffe has this thing that we put out. It's the rock, but it's uh, like the Duke D. So they laser the rock in the Duke D. Somebody had this bright idea to put the rock at the bottom of the tunnel when you come out before the game. Okay, <laughs> this I think is I know how, where this is this going. Is, yeah. This is how cut clips <laughs> <laughs> this is how it started off. And we ran out the tunnel. And I always used to come out last. I never want to be in the front. We had smoke and they do not see the rock. <laughs> they do not see the podium and the rock. And guys come out of it run and hit the rocket, fall and things like that. We have a lightning delay the first half, so we played like an hour and something later. Lo and behold, we went our first game. We beat James Madison that day. Uh, some guys were cut, bloodied up from – but like we played before we started playing. Um, but when you just look at that, you look at how we had already – started facing adversity before we even played a football game and we dealt with it good already as a team you know that would happen before cut could have got there i'd have been like yeah we're gonna lose the game but we were so excited and it's, you know and it and it, and the anticipation built up so much that we, we finally got our first win and i think that was the first part that guys actually believed that we could start winning football games and and that's what we needed how were you able to carry that on into the next season? Because the team did even better in year two under Cutcliffe. So I'll tell you this, this. That was my first season with the same offensive coordinator twice. You know, every year I had a different offensive coordinator. My freshman year, Billy O'Brien. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter Voss, my second year. Then it was Kurt Roper. Then I had Kurt Roper again. So now you get a kid to be able to excel. You need, you know, consistency, you know. And I finally had consistency. It was the same plays. It was the same system. Now I just need to learn the intricacies of the system and start getting better. And I had one of my better seasons. And I knew what coach was going to call based on the hashes. And I knew what he was thinking. And, and we were on the same page. And so, you know, that that was – that's when I knew, like, yeah, I got it down pat now. Like, I, I'm, I'm ready. The game had slowed down for me. I knew I was throwing the ball almost every play. I knew our protection, I knew coverage, and yeah, that was the first time I actually had an opportunity to have the same offense two years in a row. That season, you threw 206 passes without an interception. I mean, there was a a very long streak going. Did you think about that every time you went out there? I'm sure the media, I'm sure we brought it up all the time. Yeah, you guys bring it up. But for me, it was like, I just ignore the noise. I'm trying to win football games. I'm throwing, and I didn't even know until it came out in the paper. Half the time, I don't know my stats until somebody tells me when I'm about to do an interview before, and they be like, hey, they might ask you this, be ready to answer this, and things like that. Half the times I don't know. I don't. And it's like, oh, man, that was pretty cool that I got that record. But You, you know what I'm saying? But – if we win in football games and individual accolades, they show up. So I was more so worried about winning football games than people would acknowledge your individual accolades because you did it as a team. Sure. You yeah. ended with a few more accolades, the most passing yards and the most passing touchdowns, 67 touchdowns, over 10,000 yards through the air. Looking back on that, I mean, how impressed yeah. are you? And looking back on that, to keep it honest with you, is in 2009, I was a part of history. 
you know, looking back on that. And you don't think nothing of it, but just thinking about it now, it's about five guys in since the ACC existed to throw for 10,000 yards. I think I'm fifth on the list. But in 2009, it was only one player that had ever done that. And that's that jersey behind you, Philip Rivers. Mm-hmm. It was only one player that had actually done that. And then this little kid from Miami, from Opelika, the section of Opelika in Miami, went to Duke University. And I weathered the storm. I had three offensive coordinators, four years of college. I had two head coaches, you know what I'm saying? And you think about where the culture was and the guys were before that. And it was like, hey, man, you did a, a thing and you left a place better. Because when I got to Duke, the practice field wasn't 100 yards long, okay? Then we had a little small patch off there on the side with the defense guys. That was grass, and ours was uh, turf. Now they has grass outside in a crazy indoor facility. Yeah. So when you think about that, you left a place better. Uh, when, when I think back on it and reflect on it, it's like, wow. Like, oh, man, you did. You really did something that was amaz- amazing that you really didn't know you did until I sat down and reflect. You know, now, like, what are we doing and thinking about it? <laughs> what is it about you as a person that made you be able to overcome all of those circumstances and still have the success that you did? My mom. Growing up in a single parent home, uh, I'm way bigger. You know, I'm six one, two. I think I was taller than my mom in the fifth grade, but she was five two. She put the fear of God in me and my brother, <laughs> and she raised two boys. And she told us that I was not losing my kids to the streets. And you know where you grow up at in the inner city, you know, and and things like that stuff happens and. And she was so strict. And today I thank her for that. I used to be like, man, I can't go outside. I have to be home before the street lights come on. She won't let me go play with my friends on Sunday. And thinking about that, thinking back on it, reflecting on it, I just told her one day, just thank you. Like, for being so tough, being so strict. She never quit while I'm quitting. That's you know? amazing. Yeah. And she, she raised two boys. We always had a roof over our head. We always had food on the table. You know, she always had, we always had shoes on our feet, clothes on our back. Even if it was tough, we all, we never went without. She made it happen. So why can't I do the same thing? And me growing up so tight with my mom, because my brother nine years older than me, he was in college. So I was by myself. So I had to learn how to be very independent at a young age. And she taught me that. So seeing what she went through and the little stuff that I was going through in college and things like that. I was like, one, I want to make her proud. Two, she never quits, so I'm not quitting. Your mom sounds like an amazing woman and definitely have made her proud. You graduated. You had a lot of success in college. When you were done at Duke, I mean, what were some of your next options? You went undrafted. What was that process like trying to figure out your next move? Oh, man, that was tough. Uh, My heart hurt. Every kid wants to get drafted. Every kid wants to get drafted, no matter what. And then I sat back and I looked at my stats compared to everybody's stats and the guys they had around them, and they got drafted mm-hmm. before me. And I was like, wait, I did the same thing these guys did. What's the difference? I did it with less talent around me, and I have the same numbers. What's the difference? So I kind of took that, and I always had that chip on my shoulder. And I had one phone call, and that was in the seventh round, and I was like, Bruce Warwick called me, and Bruce Warwick worked at Duke with Ted Roof before he got fired, and he went back to the NFL. Bruce Warwick called and said, Thad, we're going to take you as an undrafted free agent to the St. Louis Rams. This was the seventh round. If nobody drafts you right now, we're going to give you 2500 And that was my one, my only call, and my one opportunity into the NFL. And I said, I will make sure I make it my best. And I wind up making a 53-man roster. So you signed with the Rams in 2010 as an undrafted free agent. You're there for a year when the Browns claim you off the waivers in 2011. And that is where you got your first career start. Take me through that game. That was amazing. Because people don't know the story. So I give you the backdrop. I actually, um, that season, week six, I got cut and put on practice squad. And so when you get on practice squad, you know, a lot of people, you know, feel like you're playing quarterback. No, you're doing everything just to help the team. 
So I hadn't played quarterback. And I sprained my thumb the last preseason game. So I hadn't played quarterback since September. I'm playing every other position, scout team, wide out, defense, special teams. I think I take every snap of scout team the week before I have to start. So Brandon Weed played. He gets hurt. Colt McCoy goes in the game. He gets hurt. I get a phone call like, where are you? Because I didn't even travel. I was on practice squad. I'm like, I'm, I'm in Cleveland. It was like, okay, we, uh, we're going to sign you back to the roster. Get ready. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm thinking I'm backing up Colt McCoy. Call me back 10 minutes later, say, you star and coats out. I jump in the car and go straight to the facility. I go straight to the facility. I start watching film. I start preparing. We playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'll never forget. They had the number one defense in the league. And I remember the stats because me and Antonio Brown were childhood best friends, childhood friends. People don't know that. Uh, we went to third grade together, Henry Reeves. And I'm playing against one of my friends. He's he's a mega star in the league right now. He's starting at wide receiver now. I get my opportunity, and uh, the score was ten ten going into the fourth. We lose twenty four to ten, and me and him swapped jerseys at the end of the game. So, just to to understand that I got an opportunity to play in the NFL, which some people never do. I started the game, and I got to play against one of the guys that I actually went to third grade with, and we walked home from the third to the fifth grade every day together. <laughs> so it was it was it was amazing it was a blessing it was a dream come true i had fun i wish i would have won that game but when you think about it the talent that was on that field that i played with they were young travis benjamin josh gordon as a rookie travis benjamin as a rookie trent red trent richardson as a rookie you know what i'm saying you're looking at some of these guys and it was just like we just out there having fun and we took uh took them to the wire so that was that was great yeah, I mean, you had a good game, 22 of 32, 204 yards, touchdown. So not bad for your first career start. And not then bad, not bad. You jump through a few teams after that, but when you land with the Bills again, you get a few more opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, right. EJ Manuel gets hurt, the starting quarterback there, and you're able to, to come in again. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember your first win? Yes, in Miami. Mm -hmm. In my in my hometown. So the week before we lose to Cincinnati. Yeah, we lose to Cincinnati. And then we going home. And uh I, I never forget. I bought like twenty five tickets. I gave them to my mom. I said, I don't want to talk to nobody, you give them out. You give them out. I just have twenty five tickets, it's all I'm giving, you give them out. And the amount of support and the amount of people that came through there um to just to support to see me. my high school coaches came. My little league coaches came. Everybody that touched, that 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 touched or, or or was with me throughout my, you know, everything that's happened, were there to support me. My mom, my brother, my nephew was born at the time. He was three, and so it was just amazing. And I got that win, man. And and and, and I think the, the Buffalo Bills didn't think we were going to win, you know, because I'm I'm on practice squad. We playing with a practice squad quarterback. They they didn't mm -hmm. think. They didn't know like. No, like this is what I like to do. So I was excited for the opportunity. I knew I had to make the best of it, but my first win was against the Dolphins. I think my only two wins in the NFL were against the Dolphins. Yeah, both against Miami. Your record <laughs> two and three as a starter. Not right. bad. Your last bad. game as a Bill mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at Gillette Stadium against Tom it's Brady. Yeah. And you had better stats than he did when it was all said and done <laughs> in that game. However, Patriots did get the win there. Taking right. the field, being there, you know, in Gillette Stadium, playing against Brady. I mean, how did you even attack that moment? It was fun. That was my second time actually going against him. I had an opportunity to play against him my rookie year in the preseason. Mm. In 10, up there in Gillette Stadium. And so me getting the opportunity to play against him was fun. It was raining. I never get any. To this day, we talk about that game all the time. He asks me all the time, how did you throw the ball in the rain? Because it rained the whole game. And I told him, I said, man, that's being from South Florida. Yeah. <laughs> I said, because it rains so much, and, and we play football during hurricane season, mm -hmm. you know? And so sometimes it's just rain, you have to play. 
And I said every day at practice, man, to keep it honest with you, a lot of my practices were wet because it would rain. When school got out at 2, practice started at 3, it would get delayed to about 3.34 o'clock, and the sun come back out, and we had practice every day. That was just how the weather was at home. Yeah, but afternoon man, that was fun. Afternoon showers, afternoon yeah. showers. That was fun. That game, even though it was a lot of implications, and it, I think if I remember correctly, if it wasn't for that third quarter, they had a heck of a third quarter. We was in the game. That was a great football game until the end. And after that game, I flew to Atlanta to watch um, Duke and um, Texas A&M. And that's when Texas A&M came back. And the funny thing is Mike Evans is on this team right now. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of correlations to people that you've seen yeah. play, played against along the way, and That's where you're great. at now. No uh, how much do you watch Duke's games, and how often do you get back to campus? So I used to come back to campus all the time. Um, I actually did my rehab there when I tore my ACL. I finished my rehab at Duke. Um, that's how I got to meet Daniel Jones, and we crossed paths and things like that. Um, I haven't been in about two, three years. I try to catch the games when I can. I know this year was a different year, but I'm always trying to catch the Duke football game. And they always give me grief around here because, you know, Duke is still – a lot of guys went to SEC Big Ten schools. And I tell them I went to Duke, but that's my team. I love them. I watch them to death. And uh, I know we're going to get back, you know. I know we're going to get back to where we want to be. It was a different season this year. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a tough season for us, but – I love my Duke Blue Devils. What they say, once a Dukey, always a Dukey. So. <laughs> there you go. You mentioned uh, your rehab tore your ACL in 2016. Uh -huh. You uh -huh. tried to come back after that. Uh, when yeah. did you realize that maybe your playing career was done, and, and how did you handle that? When I came back. So I came back when I was with the Ravens, and i never forget um, I had the chance to play against the Bills, my former team. I did okay. And the next week, they was like, hey, we're going to play you. We're going to see what you can do. Because I got there the second preseason game. And I'm like, all right, cool. I'm excited. And I'm playing well. I'm running around, and I got hit again on my knee. And the mental block that I had was like, oh, did I tear it again? Is it hurt? It's getting stiff. And, and I went out the next series, and I missed three throws that I could make in my sleep. And I was just like, yeah, I think it's over. I think it's over. I was like, I'm shell-shocked, and I ain't never been shell-shocked ever in my life. And I was like, I ain't never been scared to take a hit. Right now, I'm scared to take a hit. Uh, but that season, I was like, if I can get one more year in the NFL and maybe start feeling back, I didn't feel normal until probably a year after that, you know? Uh, so guys who just want to come back and play after the ACL, it's, it's different. It's like you, your mindset has to flip. And I was 28 at the time when I tore my ACL. Coming back at the age of 29, I had never had no surgeries up until then. Um, the rehab was crazy. And you just don't know what you don't know until something happened. And and I knew. And I set out that whole year season, and I went. Um, i never forget this. I went on vacation. I turned 30. I turned 30. I forget, yeah, I, t I tore, my, tore my ACL at 28. I turned 29. 30, when I was turning 30, I went to Belize um, for a whole week. Mm -hmm. I was like, man, what am I going to do? Like, what am I going to do? And I sat on there, and, and I was uh, on the water, and I got in front of my hotel door, and I said, you know what? I said a prayer. I said, if, if coaching is for me, just have one of my one of my coaches called me. How Chip called me. I just said a name. I said, this coach is for me. How Chip Kelly called off me a job. I knew he was getting a job at UCLA at the time. Mm -hmm. I kid you not, three weeks later, Chip Kelly called me. <laughs> Chip Kelly, somebody that you played for um, mm -hmm. with the 49ers and the Eagles. Uh, he right. bounced around to a bunch of different teams. Yeah. But before we get to you landing with UCLA, mm -hmm. they call you a journeyman. You were on several mm -hmm. teams. Lots of practice mm -hmm. squads, lots of cuts. Mm -hmm. How did you mentally, emotionally just fight through all of that? You learn the business side of it. Nothing personal is business, you know? At some point in business, if you run your own business, you might have to fire, let somebody go, even if it's 
right or wrong. You get what I'm saying? That's just that's just the business side of it. So once I learned the business side of it, and that came very quick because I made the 50 round roster as a as a rookie, mm-hmm. and then they waited two weeks and cut me on a Saturday and then put me on practice squad. You know what I'm saying? So I learned the business side of it really fast, and I was like, okay. So I was like, they cut me. Like, do my money change? They were like, yeah, your money changed. I'm like, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I <laughs> so I learned the business side of it really quick. And once you learn the business side of it, you just don't take it personal. But at some point, at some point, you be like, gosh, like when is somebody gonna give me an opportunity? When is I'm gonna get my break? Do they not know what I did in college and things like that? And you just understand the business side of it. One, I wasn't drafted. I was undrafted. So if I look at the business side of it, how can anybody justify starting an undrafted guy with guys that were drafted and more money is invested in them? I start thinking like that, and I was like, okay, Lord, I get it now. <laughs> okay, I get it now. You know, it's, it's it's a money thing, and it's the business side of it, and that's just what it is. And so I was like, well, they keep cutting me. It don't look like I'm making enough money to just retire for the rest of my life. So I better try to save enough to just get ahead in life because I know I'm going to have to do something else after this. And so I learned that real, real early. Real, hey, is that real deep education? Early. That's smart. Man, I learned. <laughs> yeah, I learned that real early. And when I learned that real early, I was like, I'm trying to pay as long as I can and save as much as I can. If I wind up getting getting an opportunity where I can make it, make enough to retire, that's cool. If not, I'm going to be ahead in life when I get up out this lead. And so I took that approach after my first time getting cut. Good for you. Because I, I was like, wait, they can just do that? They don't have to honor my contract? I was like, no. I was like, okay, I need to learn something right here. <laughs> well, yeah. you lasted until 2017 after entering in 2010. Not bad. And then... No. As you mentioned, 2018, you join Chip Kelly's staff at UCLA Mm -hmm. as an offensive Mm -hmm. analyst. Why was that an immediate yes for you when he called? Because, one, I knew the system. I knew the system. And, two, I knew I was coming in to actually be involved. He signals to play this college football. I'm like, cool, I know how I'm going to be involved. I'm going to be the signaler. If I'm the signaler, I definitely can learn the system. Now I just need to learn how how to game plan. I just need to learn how to be a teacher. Now I just need to learn how, you know, coaches, you know, see people and and and, and be able to he learns this way, uh, differentiate between how he learns on the field or he's good on the board and you start learning people and it was like, okay, you know, because you have to interact with people all the time. And even with recruiting and things like that. So I was like, I just need to get my feet wet. And everybody always tell you, you got to start from the bottom. So I said, cool, if I start from the bottom, let me start from the bottom with nobody I played for. You know, basically I can college and things like that. And I know this system. And it was one of the best things that happened to me. And it's kind of, I was working for Dana Bible. And Dana Bible was with me in San Francisco. So all these people were familiar. So they were, they were going to groom me. Because at the end of the day, their names attached to me. And when you got people like that that's gonna help you then that was that was and, and and Dana was very, very important to my development. He was very important to that. I tell anybody that tough, hard nosed, old school, that's what you need. That's that's how I get down, I learn. Um and he was he was he was very important. I remember it was so funny, I just talked to him the other day. So You spent two years there at UCLA and then this past season, you joined the Tampa Bay Bucks team mm-hmm. as a part of their fellowship program. Mm-hmm. What did that mean exactly, and what are you doing for them? So I, I, I did the fellow program um, with them, and it was just a fellow program. And when I talked to uh, Bruce Aarons when he called and offered me the fellow program, he said he had it for all of training camp, and it could possibly be for the whole season. And so I was excited. I'm like, oh, man, cool. I knew what that meant, though. You come in, you do a great job, you mesh with the group, the guys like you, this and that, you'll get kept. If not, you're going home. That's how I took the translation. It's a tryout, right? It's yeah. a tryout. I took it. I was like, I done had a bunch of tryouts. I know that. I done went so many different teams. And so I, I had already knew what to do. I had been coaching for two years. I knew not to wait. 
I knew not to sit back. I knew not to, you know what I'm saying? Anything I can do to get involved, and I just asked him, hey, you need some help with this, you need help with that. The, the last week of training camp, he comes in, I'm talking to the receiver, he's like, hey, let me holler at you, let me see you. At this time, you know, it's COVID, COVID crazy, everybody elbowing, each other, mm-hmm. no, no fists, no nothing, it's early in the season. He said, man, you came in, you did a great job. He said, so I'm like, oh, snap, I'm like, what happened? <laughs> You know, he said, no, but you exceeded our expectation. You did more than great. So we want to reward you with a contract to work for us. That's an offensive, you know what I'm saying, like quality control base, like an offensive assistant. And mm-hmm. I was like, heck yeah. I gave yeah. him a big old hug, like forget COVID. Like I gave him a big <laughs> hug. <laughs> and, um, and, and for me, I almost cried because it's like, man, I just feel like, from everything I've been through as a child, Duke University, uh, all these coordinators, all these coaches getting cut on and off the team, I just finally felt like uh, I'm getting my due, you know, and it might have took long, but just for anybody, don't put a time limit on stuff. You never know, you know, and I was persistent, and I knew I wanted to coach, and I knew I wanted to be a quarterback coach, and I knew I wanted to be in the NFL, and my journey was just different, but I never wavered. You know what I'm saying? That that detour sign sometimes you see in the middle of the road, some people might be like, ah, I ain't turn around. I'm like, ah, I come tomorrow. No, you just go left or right, go around it, but you're eventually going to get back on that road. And so that's how I felt like my life was and to get to where I was at. And and for me, it felt like a, a relief, like finally I get my due. And But now it's, now it's more like, I just want to show you that you didn't make a mistake keeping me. So now I want to get into it. And it's been fun. It's been a great ride. Um, there's been some great people. I learned a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of football here. It's crazy. The amount of people that coach football is it, so much knowledge and years of football in this building. I could sit in any office and, and talk to people. And the biggest guy that's here that I talk to all the time is Tom Moore. He's 82 years old. Coach Peyton Manning. He's been in a couple Super Bowls. He was coaching with Chuck Noll. So I was like, how do you not get better? You know? So, Mm -hmm. I mean, so for me, that was a big relief, just getting that opportunity. And I was like, I'm in now, so make sure I do everything I got to do to stay in. So never never satisfied, never comfortable. No, great mindset. Yeah, have to be like that. You joined the team a, a pretty interesting year considering everything that happened in the off season. You know, Tom Brady's back there as the quarterback. Mm -hmm. You mentioned him and your relationship, how you talk about that. Um, You know, what is that relationship like and and how much do you guys kind of banter back and forth about old times and and how much it's cool, you know, it's cool. And it's just like, you just bounce ideas off each other. If you ask me a question and you want to know certain things, you know, I just tell him, but for me, it's me sitting back seeing how he's done it for 20 plus years and seeing how he preparing, how he do things. But if he asked me a question, like one of the things he asked me was like, hey man, how did you throw the ball in the ring? Like for real, like I really want to know. Tom Brady wants to know everything. I say, you know what Tom, I'm going to keep it on with you. When, you. when you're throwing the football in the ring, you know, sometimes we grip the ball really hard. You just can't, you just got to feel it come off your fingertips. Because if you grip it really hard, one is wet. It's heavy. Mm-hmm. We're gripping it really hard. We're trying to throw it hard. So if I just use my fingertips and just let it come on my fingertips, it's catchable for the receivers and it's not coming as hard. Hey, we got to think about them too. And he was like, okay. But he took them notes. Like, if it rain, he's going to remember that. You, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's just the type of person he is. He wants to know everything, you know, how you see stuff, this and that, how you learn, things like that. And you just bounce ideas off each other. You know, for me, uh, this year, is, I'm just a sponge. You know, my, my mama's like a fly on the wall in the room, just, you know, just sitting back and taking it all in and learning and seeing, you know, if I had my own room, how would I do things? And now I got a veteran guy like Tom. If I was coaching a veteran guy like Tom by myself, like, what would I do? You know, I just, you have to think about, you know, because in everything is a lesson. Nothing's never lost. And everything is a lesson. So you just figure out the lesson in that and you try to get it and add it to your repertoire, you know, moving forward. You mentioned growing up with Antonio Brown. Now he's there with the Buck. How cool is it to kind of be back on the same team as him? It's crazy. 
it's it's, it's amazing because I can leave work and I can go to my my friend's house and, and and play with him and you know, talk to him and play with the kids, you know, and go outside and shoot hoops with the kids and you know see his kids grow up. You know, I don't have any of my own yet, but you know, just and it's just like a familiar face, you know in the place and just to see him get back to what he's, you know, what he's doing. He's back in the league. He's, you know, in a great place. Everybody know what he went to, but, you know, just to have my friend here, man, you know, you, you never kick a man while he's down. That's rule number one where I'm from. You always help him up. So I'm here and I can help. Um, and, 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 and that's the best thing, you know, that I, that I get a kick out of. I can help my friend, you know, and I know the system he came in and, uh, I can actually go to his crib and say, hey, let's study, you know, let's go over this. And he would know everything that's going on. So I'm able to help him. He's able to help me because he's at the best at what he do. I mean, you should see how he t- his regimen, how he take care of his body, you know, how what he eat, you know, what he don't eat and things like that. So I'm just learning from him and he's learning from me, man. You know, it's, it's, it's give and take. One hand washes the other and it's been amazing. It's been a pretty fun season for the Bucks in the playoffs. What's been the feeling just being a part of all of that? Shoot, just like the Bucks, this is my first time in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> even, even though I played, you know, seven years, I never made the playoffs. But it's exciting. Um, like Levante Davis from Miami, he's been here the whole time. Mike Evans been the whole time. He's never made it to the you know, to the playoffs. But just to see those guys go out and play their first playoff game and get their win, and it's now it's like, okay, cool. Like, we was losing games. Man, it's only one undefeated team I remember in the NFL. And 72 Dolphins. Mm-hmm. Never been done besides them, so nothing to worry about. We're going to lose games, but we just got to do what we got to do at the right time. And our mindset was get in the tournament. You get in the tournament, you got an opportunity to win it all. And we, we we do, and uh, it's been fun, man. It's been, it's been long though. I promise you, I haven't been. It's been long, okay? Like sixteen weeks. The playoffs. You imagine we would have had a preseason too. Mm-hmm. You know, for people like, and I had never been to playoff. It's been long. It's been tough, but it's fun. It's fun. How much more time goes into coaching versus playing? It's a lot more going to coaching versus playing because. All those cards that you're looking at when you're on scout team, mm. you know, I have to do those now. <laughs> <laughs> so when the when the players get to go home and take naps and things like that, we're getting practice and everything done for the next day. So time consuming. I'm learn I don't I learned behavior. I get up at three thirty now in the morning, four o'clock. Ooh. That's learnt that's learnt behavior, okay? Trust me, when I first got here, I was like, wait, wait, what? Tom Moore was like, yeah, I'm going to see if you can get here by 4.30. I was like, yeah, I don't even think I woke up at 4.30 before, unless yeah. it was my mistake. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, but you think about it now, you get in at 4.30, nobody's really here. You knock out all your work. The rest of the day is a breeze. And I was like, oh, okay. You grinding, but it's not as long as you think. But it's long, but it's definitely longer than a player. Definitely. Yeah. What's next for you? For me, um, I want to be a quarterback coach. That's the, I want that to be my title. Thad Lewis is the quarterback coach of one of these franchises here in the NFL. College, NFL, the matter. I want. I want to. I want to do NFL. You know, I, I like NFL. A college has gotten a lot. You know, I'm pretty low key. I don't even have social media. And I got to get social media to recruit mm-hmm. kids. And, I remember, you know, I did it for two years, and some of the kids, if you hit them up, and then you don't hit them up the next day, and you hit them up the day after, like, Coach Machine called me yesterday. What? Wait, what? Like, <laughs> you know, like, I have a life, too, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's just, it, it's, it's different. But if you feel like that's something you want to do, for me personally, if I can just do all football, I'm cool with that. You know, no babysitting, again, no begging. No babysitting, kids no begging. Come play for you. <laughs> no letting no kids dictate, you know, this, that, and the third, and things like that. But because once you get to the NFL, the, the guy that makes the NFL are the guys that love this game. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, you want to be able to 
see and help young men grow and obviously give back some of the knowledge. Like I played in this league, man, look, I did things this way. Maybe you should do it this way, you know, things like that. You have so much experience. You can help guide a young guy through this league because they gonna want you coming into some money too. This is the real world now. This has none, this not college, you know. And three, time management, ain't no classes. What you gonna do, play video games all day? Or you gonna study, you know, and do stuff like that. So it's just some stuff that, you know, with this new generation that we might have to, you know, be able to guide, but if they can relate to you, then I feel like I'm young enough to that point where I can still relate. If I get old enough and I can't relate, I think I'm what is done for me. <laughs> what is some advice to players, young players that have similar backgrounds to you, um, that have goals to play at a high level? You have to remember this. It, it, it's not just you, it's, it's other people that want to, to, to be in that spot too. And a lot of kids don't realize this. I don't want to be the best. I want to be the best. I want to do this. I want to know, really. You know, it's only 2,000 jobs in the NFL. You know, it's 200-something picks every year in the draft. So that means 200, it's a case that 200 people might lose their jobs every year. Mm -hmm. Every year. So I would tell kids, if this is something you really, really want to do, you have to put your best foot forward in everything you do, in everything. Now you have to remember, it's the difference between being a hard worker and working hard. You can work hard doing something and trick me and don't work hard at something else. But if you're a hard worker, you work hard at everything you do. So if you go hard at everything you do, you're giving yourself a chance. Obviously, we know a lot of factors have to go into, you have to stay healthy and things like that. But a lot of kids, too, I see them always work on the physical part of the game. We need to work on the mental part of the game. You need to know why that coach calling that play. Know why you're running that route like that. Know how the spacing of the play. Learn concepts. Learn blocking schemes. Understand why the coaches are doing certain things. When you understand that, you become the best at what you do. You know, and you can play long and longevity. And a lot of times we just feel like we want to be the physical you know, football, to me, to keep it honest with you, is 20% physical, 80% mental. So we have to start learning that part of it. And that's going to help. That's going to help a lot of people out, you know, sure. the mental yeah. part of it, you know. And you have to learn, you know, once you get older, especially them guys in college, y'all learn how to watch film. Ask the coaches what they're looking for. Ask the coaches what they're watching on film. How do I watch film, coach? What do I have to do with our watchman? What you expect out of me to get out of this when I'm seeing what I'm looking at and things like that? Because if you don't know, then you're just playing football and you don't know why you're doing something. You always should know why. You always should know why. So that's one thing that Kurt Woper helped me with, and that's gotten me to where I'm at to this day. So That's great I advice. That. Yeah, yeah, I love it. What no is – a couple things that you do outside of football, outside of work, what do you enjoy to do if you have some time? I love going fishing. I love okay. fishing, deep sea fishing. Okay. So I, I, every my high school coach live in the Keys. I like to travel and I'm down 20 pounds since I played, but I still like to eat. <laughs> I like to go out to restaurants and nice places and eat. Um, so fishing, traveling, you know, and, and, and going out to nice restaurants is, is, is what, pretty much what I like to do. Well, hopefully we can all get back to going out to restaurants whenever we want, inside, Ooh. sometimes no soon. About <laughs> With no mask, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I really appreciate it. I love talking to you. Uh, I could talk I to you for a long time. You got tons of stories, great attitude. Thank you yeah, so anytime. much for spending uh, time. Anytime, anytime. Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you don't ever miss an episode of ACC Stars, Where Are They Now?